Welcome back. In the last part of this series, we looked at the oldest and best proof for the shape of the Earth, the pole stars conundrum, and examined how a flat Earth fails to explain the motions of the pole stars in the sky and their positions, and how simple geometry is beyond the grasp of the flat Earth community. When that last video was uploaded, I noticed that Rory Cooper had deleted all of his past videos. No matter, I'd already downloaded most of them by then anyway, so there's still plenty to go through. And since the content and claims of his new videos differ little, there's still a lot of relevant stuff to work with. Given this fact, it seems strange that he should have deleted his videos at all. It couldn't possibly be because the man who likes to wail on and on about a conspiracy of censorship wanted to delete all traces of the poundings his moronic musings attracted from more scientifically literate observers, could it? Despite Rory's bizarre tactic, we will continue with this series called The Earth is Flat Rory Cooper Says So because his claims haven't changed, and because it will annoy Jen in Kologia, who believes himself to be the gold standard for information on the flat Earth. <laughs> oh, oh, shit. I'm sorry, I find it impossible to say that phrase whilst keeping a straight face. In the second part of this series, we're going to look at the horizon and what problems it causes for the Flat Earth community. The largest of these problems is that it exists. On a Flat Earth, using the right magnification, there should be no limit to the distance you can see things at, which is demonstrably not the case. Not only that, but the higher an altitude you climb, the further across the curved surface of the Earth you can see, for reasons that should be obvious even to children. This, again, would not be the case on a flat Earth. If the Earth was flat, you should be able to stand on the shores of Mauritania in Western Africa and see New York through a telescope. This is easily demonstrated to anyone who understands telescopes. We can perform a quick calculation to find out what magnification you would need to be able to see the New York skyline from, say, Noach shot some 6,000 kilometers away. The tallest building in New York is the One World Trade Center, which stands at 541 meters. To calculate what the angular size of the One World Trade Center would be from a distance of 6,000 kilometers, we can apply the following formula. Alpha equals 2 times the arctangent of g over 2r, where alpha is the angular size of the tower, g is the actual size of the tower, and r is the distance to the object. From a distance of 6,000 kilometers, or 6 million meters, this tower would have an angular size of just over 0.005 degrees, or around 18 arc seconds. Now, let's calculate what magnification we would need to make this appear the same angular size as, say, a full moon, which has an angular size of around 0.5 degrees, or around 30 arc minutes, or 1,800 arc seconds. Well, that's actually a very simple calculation. The required magnification is simply the angular size you want the object to appear, divided by the angular size of the object as it actually appears to the naked eye, in this case, 1800 arc seconds divided by 18 arc seconds. Yes, the amount of magnification you need in order to be able to view the One World Trade Center in New York from the shores of Mauritania to appear at the same angular size of the full moon is 100 times. That's a child's telescope. Yes, a telescope that you can buy cheaply off the shelf would allow you to see the One World Trade Center from Mauritania, if the world was actually flat. Now, the Flat Earth community has its own ridiculous answers to say why this shouldn't be the case. To begin with, they will claim that the laws of perspective don't allow it, as if that phrase means anything. This fails on two counts. Firstly, magnification works no matter what angular size you begin with. If you look at something with an angular size of, say, 0.000000001 arc seconds through a telescope with 100 times magnification, it will appear 100 times bigger. There is no magical law that the Flat Earth community can present to suggest why this is not the case, and every law of optics proves it cannot be the case. Secondly, you wouldn't even need a telescope to see the One World Trade Center from this distance, even if there was a magical law of perspective. The human eye has a resolution of around 12 to 60 arc seconds, or 0.003 to 0.016 degrees, depending on the light. This means anything below this angular size is almost indistinguishable. This is the limiting factor of the law of perspective, 
that flat earthers love to wail on about without bothering to understand the mathematics behind it. The entire New York skyline spans an area of around 1,214 kilometers squared. Let's be generous to the flat earthers and make that a circle of 1,214 kilometers squared. That gives it a diameter of around 40 kilometers. From a distance of 6,000 kilometers, the skyline would have an angular size of around 0.38 degrees, just less than a full moon. Even during the night, the light from the skyline would be clearly visible to someone on the western shores of Africa, just with the naked eye. Another argument flat earthers try to invoke in order to justify why you can't see long distances once their law of perspective argument has been thoroughly debunked is that the weather will prevent you from seeing long distances or that a magical cloud of particles blocks all the light. The weather argument runs into a big problem. Light comes in many wavelengths, as any teenager should know. What weather we have on Earth that could block visible wavelengths of light over such distances will not prevent all electromagnetic radiation from getting through, which means even if we can't see New York from Mauritania visually, we could easily spot it with radar. There's a reason why radar has a range limit on Earth. It's because it's not flat. Some flat earthers are not content with this fact and try to invoke a magical cloud of particles that prevents all light from getting through. However, they have no evidence for this magical cloud, nor the physics or maths to explain its existence and properties. In order for all electromagnetic radiation to be blocked from an object 6,000 kilometers away, the atmosphere would have to be dense enough. How dense? Well, radio waves have a wavelength between 1 millimeter and 100 kilometers, with a frequency between 300 gigahertz to as low as 3 kilohertz. Low frequency radio waves can travel easily through brick and stone, and very low frequency waves can even penetrate seawater. Yes, if the flat earthers want their magical cloud of particles, which supposedly permeates the entire atmosphere, to be able to block out all electromagnetic radiation to stop anyone from being able to detect anything over a long distance, then the atmosphere has to be denser than house bricks. Do I really have to explain to even children just how stupid this conjecture is? The idea that light, electromagnetic radiation, can penetrate through dense material may seem counterintuitive, but just go into a room in your house with a radio set and turn it on. The evidence is right there in front of you. The radio waves that are carrying the signal from the radio station to your radio are electromagnetic waves, that is, light waves. It matters not that you find yourself enclosed in a brick room possibly in a dense urban area surrounded by other houses. Those light waves are still being detected by your radio. There's a reason why radio astronomy is such a good tool in astrophysics. Radio waves are not blocked by dust or water vapor, clouds in the atmosphere, so radio astronomy could even be done in the rain. For those who haven't given over their critical faculties to an unproved and undemonstrated conspiracy theory through the baseless furtive fallacy, the density of atmosphere on Venus is around 60 to 70 kilograms per cubic meter, compared to the Earth's 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. That's about 6.5% the density of liquid water on Earth, and about 60 times the density of our own atmosphere. Such a dense atmosphere didn't prevent the Magellan probe, launched in 1989, from using radar to penetrate the 250 kilometers of atmosphere to map the surface of the planet. It's clear that there is nothing about our atmosphere that could prevent all electromagnetic radiation from getting through, and thus stop us from being able to detect, visually or otherwise, New York from Western Africa. Another problem the horizon throws at the Flat Earth conjecture is the fact that we observe things disappearing over it. As we can see from this video by Musin al the Flat Earthers both embrace their law of perspective and throw it out of the window at the same time by proposing that by using a simple zoom lens to magnify ships that appear to disappear on the horizon, we can bring them back into view. The reason that this doesn't work with their law of perspective argument, as has already been stated, is that magnification works, no matter what distance you are looking at. Something 10 meters away and something 10,000 kilometers away will appear 100 times bigger with 100 times magnification contrary to what they wish to claim when you bring up the problem that we can't see New York from Western Africa. Indeed, here they seem to want to argue that magnification both does and doesn't work. The cognitive dissonance is strong with these people. 
we can also develop on this experiment to see if things really do just disappear due to our eye's resolution, or if they actually do disappear over the horizon. The first experiment we can perform involves getting several different telescopes of increasing magnification and focusing them on the ship moving away from us. If the flat earth conjecture is correct, then each time the ship goes out of view from a scope of lower magnification, it should still be visible from one with higher magnification. However, when we perform this experiment in real life, what we find is that there is a point at which the ship disappears from one telescope of a certain magnification and disappears from the view of every telescope of a higher magnification at practically the same time. Not only that, but contrary to Rory's moronic conjecture, we actually do witness the ships disappearing from the bottom up. Since we see this on a daily basis, and we also see those same ships return to port without any signs of damage, we can safely assert that they didn't sink as we witnessed them disappear from the bottom up, contrary to Rory's childish conjecture. If the Flat Earthers are unhappy with this experiment, we can expand on it further. If we have one person at sea level and another in a tower 50 meters up, then both people should be able to see the ship as it sails away up to roughly the same time on a flat Earth, since it's only the apparent size of the vessel that is decreasing and preventing us from making it out. However, what we find is that the person up the tower can continue to make the vessel out long after it has gone out of sight for the person standing on the shoreline. This cannot be a law of perspective problem, since that only applies to the angular size of the vessel, which will, in fact, be smaller for the person in the tower, meaning that they should lose sight of it first. We can prove this would be the case on a flat Earth with simple trigonometry. If the distance to the ship from the observer on the shoreline is the base of our triangle, then the difference in altitude between our observers is the opposite side of the triangle and the angle between these vectors is 90 degrees, making the triangle a right-angled triangle. Using the knowledge passed down from Pythagoras, we can then demonstrate that the distance from the observer in the tower to the ship is larger than the distance from the observer on the shoreline to the ship, and hence the ship should both appear smaller to the person in the tower and disappear from their view quicker. The fact that this doesn't happen is solely down to the fact that the Earth isn't flat. This experiment also discounts the magical cloud of particles conjecture, since the person in the tower will be looking through more atmosphere, and thus more of this magical cloud of particles, and thus should stop being able to see the ship before their counterpart on the shoreline. The fact that the reverse is true shows us that this conjecture is bollocks. Yet another conjecture postulated by the Flat Earth community to explain away the horizon is that it is always at high level. I'll say that again for those of you whose minds shut down at the stupid overload. It is always at eye level. The big problem with this is that eye level literally means at the same altitude as your eyes, and not just along whatever angle your line of sight is looking in, a subtle difference that is entirely lost on the flat earth community. Unfortunately, this conjecture can be correct even if the earth was flat. Since a big part about what defines the horizon is the ground, this requires the ground to be both below you and at whatever altitude your eyes are at, at the same time. This is an amazing physical feat. The problem here can be explained again using simple trigonometry. If the Earth is flat, then as you look at the ground further away from you, the difference in the angle between your line of sight and the vector that describes the altitude of your eyes grows smaller. Let's say you're standing on a flat earth and your eyes are around 1.7 meters above the ground and you're looking at the ground 10 meters away from you. The angular difference between your line of sight and the vector that describes the altitude of your eyes is 9.648 degrees. If you look at the ground one kilometer away, the angular difference is now 0.0974 degrees. Look again at the ground five kilometers away, roughly the distance to the horizon on the sphere of Earth and the angular difference is now 0.0195 degrees. As should be evident from all this, the further away on the ground that you look at, the closer the angular difference reaches zero, but it never actually reaches zero, which explains why the horizon may appear to be at eye level, but also why it is impossible for it to actually be at eye level. Now many Flat Earth proponents attempt to get around this problem by postulating that the horizon lies at the point of infinity, there are some problems with this infantile conjecture, however. 
Firstly, the flat earth community here demonstrates that they don't understand what the word asymptotic means. Asymptotic literally means approaching a value or curve arbitrarily closely. A prime example of an asymptotic curve is a hyperbola. Without going too far into the geometry of conic sections, for which we can define ellipses, circles, which are just a special case of an ellipse, parabolas and hyperbolas, anybody who has encountered a hyperbolic graph will have seen something like this, where the curve of the graph gets closer and closer to the x and y axes, but never actually reaches them. Just as we mentioned before about the angular difference between the vector of your eyesight and the altitude of your eyes getting smaller and smaller as you look at the ground further and further away from you, even if the distance to the horizon was infinite, that angular difference would only become infinitely closer to zero. But it could never become zero. The upshot is that, even with a horizon that lies at an infinite distance, it is still impossible, even on a flat Earth, for the horizon to be at eye level. Look. Since the Earth is flat in this model, and the vector describing the altitude of your eyes must therefore be parallel to the Earth, the horizon cannot be at eye level, because parallel lines don't meet by definition. A second problem, problem is that by invoking this ridiculous, the horizon lies at the point of infinity conjecture, the flat Earth community contradicts their solutions to the problem relating to why we shouldn't be able to see New York from Western Africa. According to the flat earthers, we both can't see anything past some arbitrarily finite distance, but also can see the horizon that lies at infinity. So we both can and can't see up to the point of infinity. With brains so susceptible to self-contradiction, it's hardly a wonder that the flat earth community has never produced anything of merit in the scientific world. Finally, let's have a look at the Bedford Level experiments. For those of you who are not familiar with this set of experiments, they have been touted around by the Flat Earth community, or Plainists as they were known at the time of the first experiment, as some of the greatest experimental proofs for a flat Earth. As Wikipedia points out, the first investigation was carried out by Samuel Burley Robotham in the summer of 1838. He waded into the river and used a telescope held 8 inches above the water to watch a boat with a 5 foot mast row slowly away from him. He reported that the vessel remained constantly in his view for the full six miles to Welmley Bridge. Whereas, had the water surface been curved with the accepted circumference of a spherical Earth, the top of the mast should have been some 11 feet below his line of sight. He published this discovery under the title Zetetic Astronomy using the pseudonym Parallax in 1849, and subsequently expanded it into a book published in 1865. This remarkable experiment has been repeated several times, and the results have been pounced upon by the Flat Earth community. However, what the Flat Earth community failed to mention is that, in 1870, another Flat Earther, John Hamden, made a bet that he could also repeat the experiment and prove the Earth was flat. Unfortunately for Hamden, his bet was taken up by Alfred Russell Wallace, a qualified surveyor, who understood the necessity of sight lines for such an experiment. Wallace like many people at the time, understood atmospheric refraction, which was causing the results that Robotham had got. He knew that, if the Flat Earth conjecture was correct, then the only way of verifying Robotham's results was to put in the necessary controls to counteract any variables that may affect the results and thus account for them. Wallace's clever idea was to place three poles at equal height above the water, spaced equal distances apart, three miles each, and use a theodolite to view them through. If the Flat Earth conjecture was correct, then the poles should all lie in a straight line. However, what he actually observed was that the middle pole appeared to top out three feet above the telescope's line of sight from the first to last pole. Clearly, the result of this experiment demonstrates that the Earth is not flat. In the following years, the experiments have been repeated several times. Each time the relevant controls were put in place, the same result was found. The Earth is not flat. Undeterred, the plainists conduced their own experiments. And what did they do? Just repeat the original experiment, stripping away all the relevant controls and act as if they didn't matter, as Lady Blount did at the turn of the 20th century. Yes, that's the Flat Earther's version of science. If an experiment doesn't give you the right result, get rid of all the controls until you get the result you want and act as if all the variables that everyone else's experiment has proved to exist, in fact, don't. As a wonderful aside to all this, 
Although Wallace had clearly won the bet against Hamden, Hamden could never accept the result and refused to pay up, even resorting to calling Wallace a cheat, regardless of the fact that every time the experiment has been done with the same controls, it has always given the same result, and even try to kill Wallace. Watching many in the Flat Earth community these days, it's clear that such tactics have never changed. The playbook remains the same to this day. Deny reality, rewrite scientific history, perform experiments without the relevant controls and pretend they're not necessary, even when the variables they are there to control have been demonstrated to exist, and do whatever it takes to censor everyone who disagrees with you. Only now they have the added hypocrisy of claiming that they are the ones being silenced, when they are the only ones doing the silencing. This is all common practice across the range in the pseudoscientific community. So, why does it appear that we can see further than we should on around Earth? Well, first, we have to reiterate that we cannot see as far as we should if the Earth is flat, which rules out that childish conjecture. Secondly, we have to acknowledge that it's not because we've got the circumference of the Earth wrong either. That's firmly established, and we'll look further into that in a later video. So if it's neither of those reasons, what is it? Well, as mentioned before, the answer is obvious to anyone who's ever looked at the horizon on a hot day. Atmospheric refraction. This is caused by temperature inversion in the atmosphere, resulting in superior mirages, Theta Morgana, and looming. These are phenomena that are very well documented and understood. In the cases of superior mirages and Theta Morgana, differences in the temperature of the ground and the atmosphere, and in the atmosphere itself, cause light to be refracted as it travels through the atmosphere. To be clear here, the atmosphere doesn't start some bizarre distance above your head, it starts at the surface of the Earth. This may seem a weird thing to have to point out, but I've actually had to do this on more than one occasion. You are surrounded by atmosphere, and the differences in the density and temperature within regions of that atmosphere cause atmospheric refraction. Anybody who's witnessed heat haze must understand this to be the case. Basically, if the vertical temperature gradient is around 13 degrees centigrade for every 100 meters gained in altitude, for the altitude of atmosphere you and the object being observed exist in, as in it gets hotter as you rise through the atmosphere, then the light reflected from an object on the surface of the Earth will always follow the curvature of the Earth and the horizon will appear flat. If the gradient is less, then the light will not be bent enough. Looming is slightly different due to the fact that it doesn't involve mirages, which is to say it doesn't involve inverted or multiple images but it still allows an observer to see objects that are located below the horizon under normal conditions. In the case of looming, density plays a key role, though since temperature affects the density of the atmosphere, it still plays a role here as well. Again, this difference in temperature and density in the atmosphere causes the light from distant objects to refract. In this case, a temperature inversion of 0.11 degrees centigrade per meter can produce the effect, the looming phenomenon is also affected by the curvature of the body you are standing on. William Jackson Humphreys was able to show, in his calculations in his 1920 paper for the journal Nature, that on a planet six times the size of the Earth, with the same atmosphere, an observer would be able to see right around the planet due to the effects of looming alone. Now many times I'm shown what is promised to be irrefutable evidence of a flat Earth. It begins with being promised that someone has a photograph in which you can clearly see the opposite shoreline of a lake which should be over the horizon, causing me to expect a photo in which you can clearly make out the opposite shoreline and all the buildings, etc. However, in the end, all I get is an image of a few lights or tops of buildings, normally with the signatory haze underneath that comes along with temperature inversion and no sign of the opposite shoreline. These photos are often accompanied with descriptions of the weather on the day, clear and sunny and hot. Unfortunately, these are the prime conditions for witnessing these phenomena over a lake, because the atmosphere heats up faster than the surface of the Earth, and the chances of having a favourable temperature gradient within the atmosphere is that much greater. In short, these conditions are exactly the conditions in which we would expect someone to see these phenomena. But if the Earth was flat, we wouldn't need these conditions. We should see the opposite shore, nice and clear, shoreline and all, all the time. Finally, 
let's take a look at the lamest claim about the horizon that is pretty much the backbone of the Flat Earth community. Yes, it's that tired old mantra, THE HORIZON LOOK FLAT! Well, here the Flat Earth community demonstrates yet again their complete inability to understand the simple concepts of scale and curvature. If we scale the Earth down to the size of a standard soccer ball, with a radius of 11.14 centimetres, then using the simple formula of dividing this figure by the mean radius of the Earth in centimetres, we can find the value we have to multiply the size of everything by in order to find its relative size at this scale. An average human, standing at 170 centimetres, would be 0.00000297 centimetres high at this scale, or 297 nanometres. One kilometre would be 0.017 millimetres, 100 kilometres would be a mere 1.7 millimetres, and one millimetre along the surface of the ball is equivalent to a little under 60 kilometres. Doesn't look very curved, does it? Standing at sea level, the horizon would lie just under 5 kilometres away, giving your visual range to be a circle of a radius of around 5 kilometres, which is a circle of around 31 kilometres in circumference. With a visual field of about 200 degrees, this means you can see about 17.5 kilometres worth of horizon. And that's being very generous and pretending that your peripheral vision is as perfect as your focal vision, which is actually only a few degrees across. Draw a circle around a point on a soccer ball with a radius of 0.087 millimetres and then tell me how curved it looks, because that's the scale we're talking about here. Now many flat earthers believe they should see a highly curved horizon when they fly in a passenger jet. Well, since the cruising altitude of commercial aircraft goes up to around 40,000 feet, or about 12 kilometres, that's the equivalent of flying above this soccer ball at an altitude of 0.2 millimetres. Doesn't seem so impressive now, does it? So, how much horizon can you see from here? Well, let's be generous and pretend the entire aircraft is made of glass, allowing you a full panorama. We can figure out the distance to the horizon using simple geometry. Let's take a circle with the mean radius of the Earth in meters. Now we can draw a line from the origin of the circle to the altitude of the aircraft 12 kilometers above the circle, giving this line a value of 6,383,000 meters. If we draw a line from this point to the tangent of the circle, we can find where the horizon lies, since it is, by definition, the point at which our line of sight reaches a tangent to the surface of the Earth. This tangent line will be, by definition, perpendicular to the radius of the circle. Now, we know the radius of the circle, we know the value of the vector from the centre of the circle to our aircraft, and we know it's a right-angled triangle, so we can use the simple law of Pythagoras rearranged to find the distance from the aircraft to the horizon which is equal to the square root of the square of the hypotenuse minus the square of the side we know. Plug in the numbers, and we get the value of 391 kilometers. Great, but we want to know the ground distance to the horizon. No problem. First, we can calculate the remaining angles of this triangle using the simple sine law. A over sine A equals B over sine B. We know the value of the hypotenuse and its opposite angle is 90 degrees, pick either of the other sides, let's use the radius, and we can rearrange the equation to A equals the arc sine of A times sine B over B. Luckily, the sine of 90 degrees is 1, so we can simplify this equation to A equals the arc sine of A over B. Plug in the numbers, and we get an angle for A of around 86.5 degrees. Using the simple law that the angles of the triangle add up to 180 degrees, we can find the last angle to be around 3.5 degrees. Given the radius of the circle, we can determine its circumference to be around 40,000 kilometers. Multiplying this figure by 3.5 over 360, we find that the ground distance is about 389 kilometers. Still, we're not done yet. We need to calculate the circumference of the horizon. To do this, we'll take a line running from the point at which our tangent meets the circle that intersects with our vector from the circle's origin to the aircraft at 90 degrees. This would be the radius of the circle that defines our field of vision from an altitude of 12 kilometers. Again, we know the hypotenuse and its opposite angle of 90 degrees, and we know the angle opposite to the line we wish to know the value of. Using a simple rearrangement of the sine rule, A equals B times sine A over sine B, and remembering that the sine of 90 degrees is 1, we can simplify this to A equals B times sine A. 
plug in the numbers and we get the value for this radius of about 390.5 kilometers. This gives your visual circle a circumference of around 2,453 kilometers. Multiply this by 200 over 360 and we find your visual field would see a horizon of around 1,360 kilometers. This is the equivalent to a circle on the soccer ball with a radius of about 6.8 millimeters of which you can see about 2.4 centimeters of its circumference. Doesn't look amazingly curved now, does it? But here we're assuming your peripheral vision is as good as your focused vision and letting you sit in an aircraft that affords you a full panoramic view. Put you into real life, narrow your perfect vision down to your field of focus, put you in a plane with a small window that cuts out the amount of this circle you can actually see, and it's hardly surprising that the horizon doesn't look incredibly curved when you are literally skimming just 0.2 millimeters above a soccer ball. From this, we can understand how only the geometrically illiterate can be baffled into believing the Earth is flat. It may piss on their parade, but it's simply no mystery to anybody who understands simple geometry, curvature and scale why we don't see an incredibly or even noticeably curved horizon if the Earth is not flat. Ever since the earliest mariners took to the sea several millennia ago, and humanity has witnessed both the motions of the stars around the night sky and the way objects moved as they approached the horizon, people have been able to apply simple geometry to ascertain that the Flat Earth conjecture is nothing more than the inane ramblings of the infantile and mathematically illiterate sections of the populace. And I want to emphasize here that in the series so far, we haven't covered any geometry beyond what teenagers learn at school and college, which should give everybody else an inkling of the mental capacity of your average Flat Earth proponent. Join us next time as we take a look at the experiment of Eratosthenes and expose some of the enduring myths surrounding it, which may surprise some of you, and the laughably juvenile proposals the Flat Earth community put forward to try and explain away the results of an experiment that even children can do to demonstrate the fact that the Earth is round. When even kids under the age of 11 are ahead of you, you know you're in trouble, guys. Thanks for watching.